How's this one look, fellas, to get out? Uh, I reckon it'll be the most intricate. <laughs> Late last year, the Australian Armour and Artillery Museum acquired three Grant tanks from country Victoria. As you can see, they were sitting in the same spot for quite some time. You can just take that. Yeah, we can yeah. stay on it. Oh, yeah, yeah. No way. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Pulling them out and transporting them was the easy bit. Restoring them to the point to which they can be displayed? Now there's a challenge. Luckily, during our other Grand Tank restoration, we made friends with Ron Fry, who has restored over a dozen of these and is likely the leading expert in all things Grand. And he offered to come up and restore one of these beasts for fun. With the help of our German engineering pal Burke, he performed what is known as a patina restoration assembling the available parts we had, but leaving it in its current rusty condition. Ron has driven all the way back up to Cairns for more Grant Tank restoration action, but this one is in a far worse condition than the previous one. It's missing final drives, a suspension bogey, track, rear decks and heaps of other things. We have most of them at our storage facility, but they still need to be refitted. It's also totally caked with mud and dirt. I wonder what's living in there. <laughs> Be sure to stay subscribed to follow Ron as he restores our second barn find grand tank right here on Workshop Wednesday. Well, here I am again at the Australian Armour and Artillery Museum. When I pulled up, I got a bit of a surprise at this one because it looks like a lot more work than the last one. I've already started cleaning it out and uh, we've got all these interesting treasures and trinkets that I've pulled out of it down here. This is the uh, one half, obviously, of the Commander's Cupola, part of the engine mount for the 6046 power pack, the twin Detroit 671s that, that these tanks are fitted with. This here is the brace to stop the uh, RBJ underneath the turret from turning. The RBJ is a rotary-based junction and it provides power to the turret. This is the cover for the RBJ and that, that, that encloses all of the electrics. This here is a fire extinguisher nozzle. These tanks are fitted out with a fire extinguisher system so that you can pull handles up there for the outside and uh, these nozzles are directed uh, at, at the engine in appropriate places to put fires out. This is a piece of junk. That's off an old dozer or something. Uh, same with that. So we, we're finding farmers um, additions added into this tank where they uh, converted it to clear, clear land, obviously. That's the, an interesting bracket that holds the dash in place. And this one's in really good condition and that's got the other side bracket on it, as you can see. So now we've got two brackets to mount that back into place again. <clears throat> what else we got here? Fire extinguisher holders for the brackets that are inside there. So we're gonna, gonna keep that. Portion of an internal stowage bin, where to keep that. How do you know all this stuff, Ron? This is my 13th one I pulled apart. And Your 13th Grant tank? Grant tank, yeah. Wow. Develop. That's the rear portion of that bent up bin up there. This here is the, uh, you might have recognised this from the Tina Restoration. This yeah. holds down the uh, Australian wire mesh grenade, oh. anti-grenade mesh. There's a periscope guard for the uh, gunner to put his forehead against. That there looks like junk to anybody, but that's actually the earth cable for the uh, 24 volt system. There's another uh, internal bin um, bracket, brace, and you'll notice it's aluminium. So we're using a lot of aluminium parts to try and keep the weights of the tank down. You'll find in later models and in Shermans and things like that, all these were replaced with steel because they were running out of aluminium because they were building so many aircraft. Oh, more exciting stuff. <laughs> Look at that. That's, that's actually the... Uh, Australian modified bracket that holds a spare wheel in place over the back oh, mud guard there. Yes, yes, yes. This twisted up bit of pipe here is actually a quite interesting piece and it's got a adjusting holes there and that's that goes on the 37 mil. The gunner can actually uh, uh, position it into his shoulder and he can uh, adjust the gun up and down uh, manually when he's got the elevation gear disconnected. That's the remains of a tank rear tail light. Another internal bin bracket which got the clip on there for the lid to lock down. 
Uh, that there covers up the uh, drive shaft uni joint, which sits right below the driver. And I thought I saw the other half of it here somewhere. Yeah, that's it there. To give you the circular shape to go over the universal joint, which is right underneath the driver's bum. There we go, aluminium internal bin again. They're the width of a 30 cal ammunition round. So they took, they took rows and rows of 30 cal ammo rounds in their link. And because the first versions of these Grant tanks had machine guns festooned all over them, including two sticking out the front that the driver actually fired and aimed by turning the tank. They found out that was a dumb idea and they <laughs> blocked off the holes later on, but all these bins were actually for all the ammunition in turn. The other half of that Australian spare wheel holder, that there looks like a volute spring holder, which on the other guard, as opposed to where this spare wheel carrier was, was welded this right here and this volute spring went in underneath this plate here and the nut did up on top and it held, held it in place. What else have we got here? Oh yeah, this here. Wow, a very rare vent fan, a little addition that they brought out for the driver to clip or bolt into his the pistol port. It's a shame the rest of the unit's not there, but because it was a, an auxiliary uh, addition, as soon as these things were sold at auction, the like, people that would buy these would pull things like this out and quickly stuck into a 1950s truck to blow some cool air because none of them had air conditioning back then. Electrical junction box, the back part of that previous piece I showed you. And you've got to be careful with these, you can't just throw them out of the tank because the aluminium goes brittle after a while and, yeah, it's, and once you break one of these you've kind of wrecked the whole thing. This is another portion of that 6046 uh, engine mount. Uh, that, that had rubber vulcanised underneath it to anti-vibration mount and that, that went with that first piece that I showed you. Oh, look at this. Wow. Oh, look at that. <laughs> what? What's that, Ron? <laughs> <laughs> when the crew commander said to the loader, change the tanks to left or right, because we're getting running low, he could select whichever tank to draw from, and that told you which tank the gate valve was pointing to. These are hard to find. Oh yeah, driver's seat, right? Driver's seat, but they're, again, the farmers pulled them out and stuck them in their Lance Bulldog tractor or whatever, uh, the old Chamberlain, and um, yeah, so these are hard to find, and they always cut them down to whatever height they wanted. Uh, a, a backrest would go in that hook in under there. Uh, yeah, that's that's a nice straight one. You have to keep that. They're adjustable too for height, so drivers with longer legs they can un, uh, pull these um, these little collets out and raise and lower the seat. But this is for the 6046 firewall color cover. And there's another half you can see that looks similar to this comes out this way. And that hole there is for the oil cooler which bolts on, and the the fans draw air through from the front to the rear and blows it out the back. This side here is access to the transfer case. These are hard to find because they're so thin. You see how floppy it is. They're always rusty and always bent. This one's a nice straight one. You just gotta find the uh, partner to it, the other side. This is the Coppola ring on top of the turret. This is uh, interesting what a farmer has done. He's welded these legs on here onto the 75 millimeter armored ammunition bin. Put it in his workshop and no doubt stored all of his welding rods in there. Ah, oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah, of course. Turret basket. Again, these are always discarded by the farmers, ripped out. They didn't care if they bent them all up. Like this one's been damaged a little bit, but normally they're really damaged. Ripped them out, threw on them on the ground, accidentally backed over them with their tractor or the tank itself. But this one, you can see they've cut the side out of it. They must have needed a piece of tin plate or something and hacked the side out of that. And it's got the remains of the RBJ, the rotary base junction on it. Uh, and all these are a constant power joints that keeps feeding power to the tank the turret as it's turning. And those power units provided power to the hydraulic system. There's the hydraulic tank there. And uh, it also provided power for the electric firing of the machine gun and the 37 mil. What's the first step? What with this? Yeah. <laughs> rattle off all the mud and uh, clean it up. There was 232 of these shipped into Australia and I myself have never actually found a standard Grant tank in its original guise. The ones I've found all had either the complete upgrade or parts of an upgrade done. We need to backdate it to an original Grant. The museum here has got two on display with the upgrades and another one in storage 
and I personally myself have two on my property with the upgrades. Yeah, they're actually quite hard to find an original grant. So we're going to cut all these upgrades and mod modifications off. I know that some people will, will think that's sacrilege, but I came to Australia in a in original grant specification, so we're not really wrecking history. We're just bringing it bringing it back to how it used to be. That will entail cutting all these uh, deflectors and tow cable holders. We've got to cut this bin off to straighten it. These uh, camouflage retainers. This great big piece of armour on the front here. It's got to be cut off. The only thing that we won't be changing, it's kind of unfortunate but we don't have them, is these suspension units. We're going to leave the heavy duty suspension units on there for now because the original M3 light units, uh, they're actually hard to find. Probably went straight to the scrap back then, I don't know. Having said that, I've seen photos, mostly in Italy, of some grants with these units on them. Yeah, they, they retain one or two as command tanks. It looks pretty brutal cutting off these modifications, but there are over 200 of these upgraded vehicles in Australia, and when they arrived from the USA, they were kitted out as standard Grant tanks. We have another two Aussie Grants in storage, so we'll be keeping all of the pieces Ron is removing for future projects. interesting to see that some are well done with stainless steel welds and nice and neatly fitted and others are just welded on with a stick welder that's usually cracked and they're the ones that are easy to cut off because you can actually use oxy and acetylene to get into the weld but the stainless ones you can't. As I said tropical upgrades entail fitting rain guards over the driver's hatch and you'll see there's a guard over the gunner's side as well. Alright, now we've got to get this air deflector off air and exhaust which came out the back here and then was shot down by the back plate and it created a great dust cloud so uh, this deflector was designed to shoot the air back up again but we also welded on a hitch you always find them broken because farmers always thought it would tow another tank or pull a tree over what they actually designed for was towing ammunition limbers it's actually hollow hence why they're always broken they look hefty but they're not I think I need a drink. <laughs> this is the, uh, the tree stump that you might have seen in the uh, barn fawn of the century episode. <laughs> uh, Cutting through it to, get to extract it out of the uh, scrapyard. There's the usual wasp nest, they're everywhere. Uh, all these are going to be chipped away. Uh, a big chunk of cat poo there. That was once silver paint. And when these were still in use in the uh, 50s and we were leaning more towards the British doctrine and starting to buy British vehicles, these were all painted silver on the inside, over, straight over the white uh, American enamel. The silver is always chipping off like this, so that, that makes it a little bit difficult to, um, to clean. You know what the easiest way to clean this out would be? It would be to flip it over upside down. Plus I can get to the underside because it's, it's got a lot of mud and rocks and gravel on the underside. I think we'll flip it over near the fire hose. What do you reckon? <laughs> yeah, we, we, we can try it. 
It beats cutting a hole in the floor. Ron was in the army for many years as a recovery vehicle mechanic and has a lot of experience with this sort of thing. How often do you get to see a tank flipped upside down? No problems whatsoever. Not with uh, 950 horsepower. Yeah, easy. Easy as, Ronnie. So what's next? What are you going to do now? Give it a good clean out. I might hang the suspension station and uh, fit that while it's accessible. And then we'll uh, do it again in reverse and put it back on its wheels again. No Straight problem. to the workshop. It's what we used to do all the time. Join us next Wednesday for your weekly tank restoration fix. So until then, I'm Kurt from Oz Armour, and I'll see you on the next one.